Good evening, my name is Paul Rudensky. I'm the Senior Director for Education here at the Museum of Jewish Heritage, a living memorial to the Holocaust. I am pleased to welcome all of you this evening. Today's program is entitled, Holding On Through Letters, Jewish Families During the Holocaust. In an age before email and WhatsApp, and in a continent at war, how did members of a family stay in touch with one another? What could they say? What did they omit? How has the record of this correspondence come down to us and what can we learn from it? What can it teach our students? We are fortunate in that one of the leading scholars of the Holocaust and a master educator, Professor Deborah Dwork, will lead us through these questions this evening. Let me tell you about Professor Dwork. She is the founding director of the Center for, Hol for the Study of Holocaust, Genocide and Crimes Against Humanity at the Ralph Bunch Institute for International Studies, the Graduate Center of New York, CUNY. Pathbreaking in her early oral recording of Holocaust survivors, Dwork weaves their narratives into the history she writes. Her award-winning books include Children with a Star, Flight from the Reich, Auschwitz, and Holocaust. Renowned for her scholarship on Holocaust history, she is also a leading authority on university education in this field. She changed the academic landscape, envisioning and actualizing the first doctoral program in Holocaust history and genocide studies. Recipient of the International Network of Genocide Scholars Lifetime Achievement Award in 2020, uh, Professor Dwork has been a Guggenheim Fellow, a Fellow at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars, and an ACLS Fellow. She currently serves on the U.S. delegation to the 34-member State International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance. Let me also add that Professor Dwork has had a long association with the Museum of Jewish Heritage. And behalf of my, on behalf of myself and on the educators who have attended our professional development programs and our stage seminars, we are grateful that Professor Dwork is here tonight and we look forward to continue, continuing to learn from Professor Dwork for many years to come. Again, we're honored that Professor Dwork is joining us today. I'd like to, before I hand the floor over to Professor Dwork, I would like to put in a quick plug for our upcoming programs. On November 15th, Natalia Alexun will examine German Jewry under the Nazis. Uh, that's Sunday, November 15th at 1 p.m. On November 16th, Wendy Lauer will present The Ravine, a family, a photograph, a Holocaust massacre revealed. revealed. That will be, I believe that's on Monday at 5 p.m. Uh, our plan for today is as follows. Professor Dwork will speak for approximately 40 minutes, after which time we will invite questions from the teachers attending the program. We will try to keep the program to an hour in length. Uh, please feel free to use the chat function to submit questions, which will be read after the program. After the lecture today, we will send you a link to an online evaluation form. Please spend a few minutes completing it. Your feedback is important to us and to our funder, the Claims Conference. I appreciate your taking this task uh, seriously. And speaking of the Claims Conference, I would like to take a moment to thank them for funding today's program. Without further ado, I am honored to present Professor Deborah Dwork. Thank you, Paul. Thank you for that really generous introduction. And Your the pleasure. most important part of it is that I am a great fan and friend of the museum and, its, and the community it serves. So the first thing that Paul is going to do is to post a list of terms which is not yet up. Is that coming? Yes. Okay. okay. I'll just wait for it. Well, I may as well explain to everybody who will be watching that Paul is going to post a list of terms and whoops. Uh, sorry. I've gone black. Okay. Okay. Let me, I will try it again. No, 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 let me. All right, let's try it one more time. Okay, no problem. All right, here we go. And you know what, Paul? Hmm. Let's skip the list of terms. I can, I, I should be able to get it. Can you see it? Deborah, can you see it? Let's see what I'm seeing. Hang on, hang on. Uh, 
Okay, good. Now I can. Okay, good. I'm sorry, everyone. No problem. So the list of terms, the list of terms, if you can go to that. So um, from the title to the terms, I just want to ensure that everyone understands that these are simply, the terms are there simply to help you listen as we go along. So if you are like I am and you hear a word you don't know, you'll turn to the person next to you and you will say, what'd she say? And the point of having the terms there is to ensure that you will see them and can, and can code them as we go along. And now it's perfect because I see the terms and I hope everyone who is watching does too. And the very first person who's mentioned there is Elizabeth Lutz. So if you see what I'm seeing, then we're great, we're golden, we're going. So let me begin. Some years ago, I was given a collection of over 1,000 letters written by Jewish parents in greater Germany and children they thought they had sent to safety in France, Belgium, and England. The letters flowed through Elizabeth Lutz, a middle-aged, middle-class Christian lady in neutral Switzerland. To bypass censors' eyes, Elizabeth Lutz painstakingly copied the correspondence she received and, keeping the original, mailed her copies to the intended recipients. Maintaining the cover that she was the tante or aunt, she served as a go-between in the tangle of wartime postal restrictions linking loved ones. Every country censored mail and her system fooled the censors. Most unusually, and solely because the letters went through Tanta Elizabeth, both the parents and the children's letters were saved. This two-sided correspondence opened a window into the dynamic of families pulled apart by their efforts to escape the Nazis. And I wondered what these and other letters revealed. What did parents say to their children? And what did children tell their parents? What concerns remained constant over time and which shifted? What is said and what remains unspoken? And what do letters tell us about the ways in which the family remained the bedrock social unit? I will start with a family that emerges from another set of letters. And it's really good that Paul got these terms up because here we go with them and you'll need the score sheet. So three generations of this family that I'm about to talk to you about found refuge in the Netherlands. Wilhelm and Adele Alberstam, their son, Albert, their daughter, Kette, and Kette's husband, Heinrich Heppner, and their three children. So there's Wilhelm and Adele, their son, Albert, their daughter, Kette. Kette was married to Heinrich Heppner, and they had three children. Kette, Heinrich, and the three children moved on to Britain. It was the first leg of a journey to Cuba thanks to visas Keta had bought from a corrupt Cuban consular official. Wilhelm and Adele chose not to emigrate. They stayed in Amsterdam with Albert and thus began their long distance relationship with their daughter and grandchildren, which depended upon letters. Do not spare us your news even when it is not 100% happy. We are prepared for that, Wilhelm wrote days after their departure. 
We do not know how long it will take letters to travel and how often they may go, but we seek to remain close to you, to share your life as much as possible. When war began, correspondence between belligerent or occupied nations ceased just when friends and kin became ever more concerned about each other's welfare. But the Netherlands was neutral until Germany invaded in May 1940. In his first letter after the Dutch army's surrender, Wilhelm wrote that of all that had transpired, the lack of news from you to us and us to you is for Muti and me, me the most heavy to bear. From this point forward, the irregular schedule of and changing route for their letters continued to worry the Halberstams. Hundreds of thousands of Jews faced the same problem. Recognizing this need, Elizabeth Lutz in neutral Switzerland stepped into the breach. Living on a small inherited income in an attic apartment in Steffa near Zurich, she undertook an extensive postal service from 1939 well into the post-war years. News about the aunt who forwarded letters spread quickly and Tanta Elizabeth gained dozens of nephews and nieces. She soon became a counselor and a confidant, although nearly none ever met her. Genteel poor herself, she nevertheless sent writing paper, envelopes, international reply coupons, also called IRCs, and replied paid postcards to youngsters and parents. And I swear, I think she used her entire monthly salary on writing materials. Through these, she supported contact against all odds between utterly impoverished children and their families. The importance of information about daily life to separated family members shines bright in all the letter collections. Severed apart, neither parents nor children could follow or comprehend fully the situation of the other, yet they yearned to understand and to be understood. The framework of their lives shifted and their loved ones knew nothing of the new context and its rules. All of this needed to be communicated letter by letter. The Halberstams sought to build up their mental picture of their daughter and her family's situation. The Hepners had left from Liverpool for Cuba on a ship called the Ordunia. Arriving in Havana on May 28, a day after the infamous St. Louis, Ordunia passengers who had obtained visas in Berlin were not allowed to land. For six weeks, the captain tried to unload his passengers in South American ports as he steered the ship to the Pacific through the Panama Canal. The Halberstams, anxious and powerless, followed the journey from their apartment in Amsterdam. Have you landed in Balboa on orders of the shipping line? Or has Panama offered to take you in? Adele asked her daughter. Is the quarantine site just a way station to a permanent sojourn in the city itself? Or must you move on again the moment Cuba or another country offers to let you in? Begging Keta to write at least once a week, Adele reminded her, I really live from letter to letter. Through a Chilean diplomat the Hepners had met aboard the Ordunia, they were allowed 
to disembark in Valparaiso and to take up residence. Relieved, Wilhelm wrote, please instruct us untaught Europeans how the seasons compare to ours and how many hours of the day are light and dark. You are always with us in our thoughts. So we really would like to know, do you get up early and finish early or the other way around? What is the main diet? Is the population light or dark? The Halberstams and Hepners tried to fill in the white spots on their canvas of knowledge. At the same time, fearing loss of contact, separated parents and children wrote repeatedly of their affection for each other. They sought to weave a web of letters to hold each other tightly and to assure each other that notwithstanding the pressures of their radically changed circumstances, their relationship endured. And each wished to feel reassured. Children pined for their parents, just as parents hungered for their children, as the letters that passed through Tante Elizabeth revealed. Eva and Susie Gutmann were among the youngsters who came to France on the kinder transport in late 1938. Elizabeth established contact between the girls and their parents in February 1940. Evacuated as the Germans approached some months later, the youngsters were sent to a children's home in the mountains run by the Jewish philanthropic organization, Ose. Susie promptly wrote a postcard to Elizabeth asking her to tell her parents about the move and to assure them that she was safe. A month later, she wrote asking Elizabeth to tell her parents that I think about them, and then this is underlined, all the time. And I have just one hope to see them again. Seeking to keep loved ones connected, Tante Elizabeth accrued ever more correspondence. Please pardon us that we write you without having asked permission to do so two boys wrote her. Our names are Adolf and Robert Hess. Adolf is 12 years old and I am 14 years. We live in an Ose home and have been selected for immigration to America. We write to you because we would like to write to our mother and have no other possibility. Please write to our mother that she can write us via you. We must ask our mother for permission to travel to America. Faced with the prospect of departure, they had another request. Can you also send us a photo of her? Providing their mother's address in Vienna, their own address, and a photo of themselves they concluded, thank you so much for sending our letter onward. Please answer us. Elizabeth did not disappoint. And those boys were included in that transport to America. Many Jews caught in occupied Europe, as well as those who helped them, resorted to code in correspondence with the outside world. Many more fell silent. A sense that the ever greater dimensions of the tragedy they endured, endured by those who remained behind could not or must not be entrusted to paper shadowed each letter. Correspondents struggled with what they should write or say. Communication between refugees abroad and family and friends left behind was burdened by the power of words and thus a desire not to utter them. 
Out of consideration for you, I do not allow my pen to overflow with what fills my heart. Why should you become as sad as I am? Adele wrote to her daughter Keta. Her self-censorship marked her first step away from communication and admission that the changing circumstances in the Netherlands challenged the mutual understanding the Halberstams and their daughter had so painstakingly rebuilt after their separation a year previous. As the occupation continued, their trust that they could maintain a common reality collapsed. The parents grew ever more silent about the tightening screws. No mention of the fear the star decree generated, not one word about the humiliation they endured. Ultimately, events overwhelmed silence. Fearing the deportation of their parents, the children who wrote to Tanta Elizabeth did not know what to say or how to express their anguish. Norbert Roth wrote to Elizabeth from an Ose children's home. It's now January, 1942. He wanted to reach his parents, Richard and Regina Roth in Bad Freienwalde, although as he apologized, he did not have any money to buy IRCs. Elizabeth established a connection, none too soon. His parents were about to be deported, he wrote in April. Would Elizabeth mail his letter immediately? Minutes may prevent the arrival of my letter in time, he wrote. And he confessed, I am completely agitated and must control myself in order not to show this to my loved ones. Who knows when or even if I will see them again. Regina and Richard were shipped to the Warsaw Ghetto, where they resumed correspondence with Norbert through Elizabeth. Norbert acknowledged his worries to her, but not to his parents. I recently read a Swiss Jewish newspaper and saw with horror how the people live in Poland. Many thousands starve to death and many thousands from typhus. In every family, there are victims. Similarly, his mother spoke only of her yearning for her children and not of the horror she experienced. Her last letter, written in November 1942, said not a word about the mass deportations to Treblinka that the Germans had just unleashed on the ghetto. I am so unhappy to have received no lines from you lately, she began. I hope you are healthy, which, thank God, I can report about us as well. We have our 21st wedding anniversary this month. The most beautiful present would be a few lines from you. But by then, Norbert had been arrested and deported to the East. Deportation, death, how all parties wondered to transmit such information. As 1942 wore on, letters accrued their final and most essential function. They served as a sign of life. No one cared what was said, so long as one received word at all. Mail took longer and longer to travel to and from war-torn Europe until all ordinary services ceased at the end of that year. Red Cross letters of 25 words or less written on what was called Form 61 and passed through the Red Cross in Geneva became the standard means of communication. 
introduced during World War I, these letters allowed civilians separated by war to exchange information of, and I quote, a strictly personal nature to family members wherever they might be. One side of the reply paid Form 61 carried the name and address of sender and receiver and a message of 25 words. The recipient wrote a reply on the back. The Halberstams turned to the Red Cross system when regular postal connection between German ruled Europe and neutral Chile ceased in early 1943. They continued to use it after they were deported from Amsterdam to the Dutch transit camp Vesterbork. Mail delays grew so long that they continually wondered whether their letters got through at all. Still, they persevered in the hope that ultimately and eventually word would arrive in both directions. The pattern of Adela's messages remained consistent. Little discussion of hardship, humiliation, or fear. And always an emphasis on family ties, love, and longing. Since June 20 here, Adela explained in a letter of August that arrived in Chile nearly a year later. That's enough. Received from Albert forwarded letters of October and January. Sign of life from Helene. Congratulate Klaus and Heinrich. Greetings full of longing. Inevitably, in Nazi Europe, letters brought news of death. Sometimes, as in Adela's Red Cross letter of October 5, 1943, this message was explicit. Last night, father passed away unexpectedly due heart attack. Albert here since four days. Of course, great happiness for me. Inform Fishers, letter follows unspeakably sad. More often, it foreshadowed what the recipient knew then or learned later was the fate of two thirds of Europe's Jews during the Nazi era. Adele's last letter, dated October 31st, read, Mother and Albert greet wishing very best. Mary also here without child. I function as an automaton, no purpose in life, in love and longing. Adele and Albert were deported to Auschwitz on November 16, 1943. They arrived on the 17th and Adele was murdered that day. Albert survived until March 31st, 1944. Tanta Elizabeth was well aware that death lured. She helped Hannah Ruth Klopstock, one of the children in an Ose home, correspond with her mother Frieda and brother Werner, Werner in Germany. When Hannah Ruth did not hear from them for some time, she wrote to Elizabeth expressing her yearning for a sign of life from them. Every day I tell myself, today I will certainly receive a letter from Muti, and still nothing. I do not know what to think about this silence. Maybe the letters have been lost? I hope so. Hannah Ruth's fears were well-founded. By the end of 1942, Frida could not imagine a happy end to the tragedy they lived. She bade farewell to her son, Werner, who had been sent to a forced labor camp in Germany, detailed to heavy agricultural work and wrote to Elizabeth in late December. I foresee nothing good, 
and must hold myself together. Frida thanked Elizabeth for everything she had done and penned a last request. Please help my child, the only one left to me, Hannah Hoot, and console her when this heavy fate will touch me also. Frida was deported to Auschwitz six weeks later in February, 1943. It fell to Werner to relate the news to Elizabeth and Hannah Hoot. As you see, I alone must write this letter because as I just heard, Muti has not been at home for the past week. Werner followed less than a month later as Tante Elizabeth soon learned. A postcard she had written to him was returned with the address crossed out and the words in German zurück and French retour parti. Remarkably, this was not the last sign of life from Werner. Could I have the image please, Paul? In, thank you. In early August that year, the mailman in Steffa delivered a standard postcard from Werner written in a quote, labor camp in Upper Silesia on July 18 and mailed in Berlin, not in Upper Silesia. The sender, as you can see on this postcard, was Werner Klopstock, Arbeitslager Jafischowitz, House 3, Oberschlesien. Tante Elizabeth knew a lot about what was happening in Eastern Europe. She did not know about crematoria and gas chambers, but by 1943, Auschwitz had acquired its reputation as a deadly concentration camp. But even if she had surmised that Arbeitslager Jagdeshovitz was a subcamp of Auschwitz, we will never know if the evidence offered by the postcard signaled to her that this was not an ordinary concentration camp. Werner was not an ordinary inmate and the card, no ordinary card. Paul, can I have the flip side? Written in block letters, Werner's message ran, Dear Tante Elizabeth and dear Hannah Ruth, I inform you today that I am healthy and remain here for the future. Sadly, I have no news from you but I hope you are well. For today, very hearty greetings from Werner. Six lines, not the 10 that ordinary concentration camp postcards were permitted and no other postcards followed. What we know now was that the Nazis too recognized the importance of letters. Indeed, they unrolled a special project called the Letter Program of the Reich Security Main Office to deploy letters to their benefit. Cards as camouflage. According to Dieter Veslitzeny's testimony in the Nuremberg trials, this program was one of his boss Adolf Eichmann's inventions. He had thought out a special system of postcards and letters whereby he believed he could mislead the public. The Jews brought to Auschwitz or to other extermination camps were forced prior to being murdered to write postcards. These postcards, there were always several for each person, were then mailed at long intervals in order to make it appear as though these persons were still alive. And thus, letters that seemed 
a sign of life served as markers of death. That is the end of my talk to you. And now I would be very grateful if you would speak to me and to each other to think about how you might use this information, letters, correspondence in the classroom. So uh, I, I leave this to you, Paul. No problem. Thank you. Uh, um, Deborah, thank you so much for a fascinating presentation and an inspiring presentation. Uh, uh, it's, uh, I'd like to hear from the, from the attendees how they would, uh, how they see using this material as, as you said. So let's give everybody a few minutes to, uh, to respond to the chat. So I'm gonna start reading some of the comments if that's okay. Uh, here's a comment. In all my years of attending courses, I've never felt so deeply in my bones, the desperation. Let's see if we'll have some other comments. I can understand that. So let me, while we're waiting for the, the questions to come in. So Elizabeth Luz, how did she, and I, you may have said this in the beginning and I was working on the PowerPoint, so my apologies, but how was it that um, she uh, started doing this, started forwarding, receiving and forwarding these letters? It's not 100% clear because she didn't leave a record of that, but what I've been able to piece together is that she lived next to, or nearby, near a camp, that a, a holding camp for Jews and others who had fled Nazi lands. Um, they had fled into Switzerland. And rather than send them back, the Swiss government held them in these transit camps. So, there was nothing nefarious about them. These were places to lodge uh, refugees, period, refugees. Elizabeth was a very believing Christian and she felt that it was her responsibility and also her joy to ease the burdens of others. She began to visit that camp and what from, again, from what I can piece together, the need expressed by the men, and it was men to begin with, um, the men in the camp to contact and to be in correspondence with family members at home opened an opportunity for her. She saw something that she could do. And so she began to carry on those correspondences. That was the beginning. That's what I pieced together. Thank you so much. Um, okay, now we do have some, so now we have some questions coming in. Uh, so um, I think you may have answered that question already, but how did these parents and children know about Tonto Elizabeth? It was absolutely snowball effect. Um, there was no advertisement anywhere. So Elizabeth, for example, she wrote to this, she wrote to the family members of a man who, um, who was in that camp. And this is actually what makes me think that this is how she began her work. Uh, anyway, that fa those family members in Vienna then gave her name to friends of theirs. And the friends of theirs wrote to her asking her if she could have contact with their children. So it, it, from one person to the next, the same thing with those boys that I mentioned who, were, who wrote to her 
asking her to have contact with their mother because they were wanting her permission to go on a transport to the United States. They got her name, they got Elizabeth's name from a girl who lived in that same Jose children's home. Wow. Okay, we have some more questions here and comments. Um, let me just read this one to you. Uh, listening and reading some of these letters provides us an understanding of the despair and hunger for freedom and communication. Providing this look uh, or this perspective to our students will definitely give them a real perspective. It also provides our students to look at survivors and those who passed away, not only as victims, but as human beings. I think that's really important always to fight against that, um, that anonymity of the victim and to make the victim particular, real. That victim was once a living human being and it's trying to reconstruct, recreate, reimagine that living human being, which is our job as educators. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, uh, here's another question. Uh, well, so this is sort of throwing this back at, at you know, re replying. What is the most important theme in showing these letters to our students and how can we translate this understanding to them? And I would like to add another question to that, if I may, which is where can we, and you may have said this already, so I apologize if I didn't hear you. Where can we get this material? So that the first part is what's the most important theme and how do we translate that understanding? And the second is how can we as educators have access to this? Some of these very letters I've written about, I have written about some of these very letters in Flight from the Reich. So you all are welcome to get that from your local libraries. Um, so that's one piece. And what is the most important theme in showing these letters to our students? For my part, I there are many different themes. One is the ways in which families who are torn apart by politically inflicted actions um, want information, seek information about each other. So the ways in which the family functions, um, but also I think we can transpose that to the situation of refugees and asylum seekers in our country today. Well, thank you, thank you. And I think we have some more questions here. Let me just go and take a look here. Um, okay. Uh, Go ahead. Let me just say this one thing. I uh, and this is yet another reason to to regret that we are not in person. But I would like to ask the fellow who asked me about what is the most important theme in showing these letters. I would like to turn that question right back to all of you. What do you think is the most important theme? That's, that's a very good, very good point. Very good question. Okay, I hope everybody's going to start writing. While you're writing, here's another question. Um, although Tanta Lutz did not rescue Jews as in hiding them, did her efforts qualify her for Righteous Among the Nations? No, her efforts did not qualify her for Righteous Among the Nations because she was in neutral Switzerland. First of all, for a number of different reasons. But the, one of the most important pieces about Righteous Among the Nations is that the actions had to have been at risk of one's own death. And Elizabeth, Tante Elizabeth was in neutral Switzerland. She was never at risk. Wow. Wow, okay, thank you. And let's take a look here. Oh, here's another question. Um, how was the German writing plan deception uncovered? It was never uncovered. She was never charged with anything. Um, it, it's not quite clear to me why she copied every letter. 
I mean, I do understand that she assumed that this would fool the censors, but how the censors wouldn't have become suspicious of somebody writing so many letters doesn't quite make sense to me. And there's an apocryphal, an apocryphal story that the postman said to a neighbor, this woman writes a lot of mail, <laughs> but we don't know if that's true. Wow. Okay, I see here's another question that just came in. Okay, so, um, so to answer the question that you just posed, the most important theme uh, is the yearning to know about loved ones when they are separated. Also the tendency of those who are in dire circumstances not to burden their loved ones with their own suffering. I think that's right. Yeah, no, I think, I think so too. I think so too, but I would even argue um, that it also gives us a kind of a window on what's happening. And, and as you pointed out, what, what people say, what they don't say um, in itself is kind of telling. Absolutely. Absolutely. That was, the, that was my impetus for studying these letters. And exactly, what do people say? What do they want their loved ones to know? What do they hide from their loved ones? So right. I, found it, I found it astonishing that the Halberstams don't even mention any anxiety having to do with the star decree. Nothing. Right. Although that could have been censored also. Meaning if they had, it would have been censored. So, so here is, um, here's another, another comment. Um, uh, uh, it says in my family's letters, uh, post-war money was referred to as lokshan. So I guess this idea of some sort of code. You yes. Know. Yes. And many families um, devised code. Sometimes they did it before when upon separating, they decided if I talk about aunt so-and-so, it means death or whatever. Um, and sometimes they just counted on each other to be able to decode what they were writing. Right. I know that we had a postcard in, in our core exhibition that talked about going to visit Uncle Mavet. Exactly. You know, Uncle Death, So, uh, which I think is something like that. Okay, I have a couple more comments here. Um, another theme uh, could be that in adversary, the love of com and comfort of family prevails. It is amazing. We hear endless talk about the end of the family, the family, end of the family unit. And yet what we see is that in certainly in adversity, I'm sure also in other circumstances, but unfortunately I mostly suffer, I mostly study adversity. The, the family emerges as this bedrock unit. It did then, and it does amongst refugee and asylum seeking families today. Thank you. Uh, here's another theme uh, from the same person who asked that question originally about the themes. Uh, a theme can be also, also can be the openness uh, to who these people were. It builds, it, uh, it builds a bridge between our time and that part of history. It can also open up this idea of choices during the Holocaust. Absolutely. I think those are all really important themes. I agree. Me too. Okay. I'm just wondering if there's any other questions. Um, uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you have any other questions, now is a good time to post them. So we'll give people another minute if they want to send in one final question. Oh, here comes a long question. Okay. Okay, here we go. It's kind of long, so bear with me. Shalom from Turin, Italy. 
a note. I remember 1950s Egypt, the communications, the communication that was censored from abroad occur, occurred through word of mouth as well as through slow mail from Europe. No communication from Israel and very rare, rare calls. Very few had telephones. I would like to note that in the Jewish archive of Turin, I noticed a very short two line note in Hebrew written on the back of a book dated 1940s, notifying the readers that they are killing us all. The sender wrote, the sender wrote from Switzerland. So that's uh, interesting. Okay. Well, um, let me take this opportunity. I think that uh, probably people have expressed what they wanted to say, but I would like to thank you. What a really inspiring presentation and um, uh, the sense of, of gratitude that somebody like Elizabeth Lutz would do this for these people. And, uh, you know, thank you so much. I, oh, I still have here. We still have another one more comment. Okay. Uh, final comment, and then we'll, we'll let people go. Um, just a comment. It would be wonderful if the subject could be made into a documentary with actors reading the letters, like in Ken Burns' Civil War. Those letters were so powerful and moving. So. What a wonderful life it would give to the letters. Yeah. Most, most definitely. So I think on behalf of every, on behalf of all of the participants today and the Museum of Jewish Heritage, Deborah, I want to thank you for a great presentation. I want to thank everybody for, for coming here and joining us this evening. Um, please join us uh, for our upcoming presentations on Sunday, uh, November 15th with uh, Natalia Alexun and on Monday, November 16th with Wendy Lauer and more programs coming. Again, special thanks to Deborah Dwork. Um, uh, and uh, I want to wish everybody a good night. So thank you. And it's my pleasure. Thank you all for coming. And thank you, Paul, for hosting. Thank you too to Joanna and Jacqueline for your work behind the scenes. Likewise. Thank you to, to, to all of you. Thank you. Have a good night, everybody.